Time now is 12.01 p.m. Uh, normal, the, I guess you say the normal, the regular scheduled meeting, the Public Safety Committee meeting, had been postponed now till today, uh, Wednesday, October 29th. And it is now 12.01 p.m. Normally we start at noon, and it looks like all the members are here today. So uh, Paul Honeman, the chair of the Public Safety Committee meeting on the assembly, and I'll just have my colleagues introduce themselves. We'll start with Ms. Gray Jackson. Dave Traney. Ernie Hall. And Mr. Steele, though not a member of the Public Safety Committee, we uh, enjoy and appreciate all of our colleagues, or as many as they can that can make it. That's good. I'd also like to, uh, excuse me? I'm a hanger on. He's a hanger on. He's a, um, I'd like to also introduce you to our municipal clerk and a municipal assembly council, and, uh, and they'll be making a presentation. So. Barbara Jones, municipal clerk. Julia Tucker, assembly council. And then I believe Ms. Uh, Amanda Mosier was also, will also be t uh, presenting as well. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Amanda Moser, uh, deputy clerk. Very good. And Amanda, if you, if you want to, if it would make it easier for you to present from up here, it's, you're welcome to come join up at the top. Or if you're OK to where you're at, that's fine. Whatever you're most, most comfortable with. Um, so, folks, today is about the, the municipal uh, ordinance uh, uh, amendments to 9.54 and 10.54, which is the towing. And uh, if there's anyone here for anything other than towing, I uh, just want you to know that we've committed uh, a majority, if not all, of our time today for the towing ordinance changes. Uh, it's fairly comprehensive. It's been a long uh, draft in uh, the making. So what we'd like to do is let you know and invite you to pick up a copy of the ordinance. I believe, Ms. Jones, is, are they up front? Um, yes, Mr. Chair. What documents we've got, I believe there's an agenda for today's meeting. There's a copy of the ordinance as proposed. There's a copy of the, the AM from um, Mr. Traney, I believe. And then there's a copy of the highlights that we'll be talking about to begin with. Okay. Christy, could you make sure, I don't see anybody up here has an agenda. Could you make sure we get a copy of the agenda real quick for the members up front? Thank you. And we're going to have a, a very detailed overview of the ordinance changes. Um, we will likely start with Ms. Uh, Barbara Jones, and uh, then we will uh, hear from uh, Ms. Tucker and Ms. Uh, Mosier uh, to explain some of the reasonings behind. We will invite uh, members of the public to um, if you have suggestions for changes, if you have comments on what you see and read to date, you're more than welcome to uh, approach the center here. There's a microphone. It, everything is, of course, being recorded as we do every month in our meeting. Um, and we decided to come to the chambers because we felt that we'd have a larger group uh, today to present on that. Uh, just so you know, for those that might be here for the changes in the taxi code or perhaps the, uh, what we see as Uber, that'll be for next month because we'll be meeting here in a couple of weeks, basically in November. But you're certainly welcome to uh, hear the, uh, the towing changes as well. Mr. Well, the other thing is, if people testify tonight, you can testify at the next assembly meeting because this is not an assembly meeting. This is just our public safety subcommittee. So you can say what you want tonight and you still have testimony time, chance when it comes in front of the assembly. That is correct. Now, is this gentleman here because we've got him on the list? Koji Gailey? Have, is Koji Gailey here? Okay. We'll uh, we have had to postpone Mr. Gailey um, a couple of meetings now uh, for various reasons, so we were going to accommodate him for a few moments, but uh, we'll just make sure we get reschedule him for the November meeting. Or That's good. Or if he shows up later, we, and we make a time accountable. Um, so with that... Uh, I'd like to start, I believe, with Ms. Jones on the overview on the updates for uh, the licensing of tow operators 9.54 and 10.54. And if you haven't got a copy, please feel free to see at the front, uh, right in front of Christy Cater Brown here. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I kind of like things to be a little bit informal. So one of the things I'd like to ask for um, those of you out in the audience, how many of you were at the work session and already heard this? If you could, so I, I see a couple of you, one, two, three, four, five, six. So to some of you, this might be a partial repeat and I'll try not to bore you too much. Um, I think the focus of this meeting that Mr. Honeman and um, the committee asked us to present is they want to hear from the towing industry and want to hear 
your input and suggestions so that we can make this work. Um, so from the drafting committee's perspective, and there were a lot of people involved in drafting on this, and if I could just take a second, Mr. Chair, and thank all those people. Obviously, Assembly Council Julia Tucker, Municipal Attorney Dean Assistant Municipal Attorney Dean Gates, um, Deputy Clerk Amanda Moser, our business license official Jamie Heinz um, here participated in that, as well as Mindy McCauley from um, APD in the Rotational Tow Program, and we had Connie Ernst from Risk Management, and certainly Mr. Traney and Mr. Honeman were big supporters and um, participants in that. And finally, our entire Ombudsman's Office, the Ombudsman Daryl Hess, Associate Ombudsman Heather McAlpine, and Deputy Ombudsman Betsy Isis. So we had lots of input and help. So thanks to all of those people. And um, we couldn't have done this without everyone working together on it. So let's just go to the highlights of the ordinance. It's a lot of pages, 31 pages, and I've just tried to put the big picture stuff on the front page of this highlights. I'll try not to interrupt too much, Ms. Jones. Just for the record, Mr. Peterson joined us for the meeting too. Thank you. So the, the, some of the highlights are, first, it, the ordinance creates a consumer bill of rights regarding towing. And the municipal clerk's office, as the um, enforcer of the towing ordinance and the licensing official, we are creating the Consumer Bill of Rights regarding towing. It's just taking some of the information that's going to be in the new ordinance and then putting in a document called Consumer Bill of Rights regarding towing. Um, I believe that the drafting group felt strongly that this was a consumer protection ordinance, and that's part of the reason why we start with the Consumer Bill of Rights regarding towing. Um, the second bullet focuses on the fact that the new tow ordinance differentiates the different types of tows, consensual tows, rotational tows, and non-consensual or private party impounds. As those of you who have read the ordinance um, probably know, Consensual toes and rotational toes have minor new changes, if any, in those two areas. Most of the ordinance focuses on non-consensual or private party impound toes. And as we heard at the work session from um, Daryl Hess and Amanda Moser, most of the concerns that the municipality has received are in the area of non-consensual or private party impounds, which is why Mr. Traney and Mr. Honeman asked the drafting committee to work on um, some of these issues. The third bullet discusses that a major change in this ordinance is that it caps the rate on non-consensual or private party impound tows. It also has um, quite a bit of information that it prohibits what are called predatory rates and predatory practices. Um, the fourth bullet is that the code now has detailed procedures for curb release or on-scene release, which is both defined and um, the procedures are detailed in the code. The next bullet is that the ordinance has required signage both at the tow operator's place of business and the private property from which the vehicles are towed. The next bullet is that it creates a new application and licensing requirements. The license application fee has increased. Um, it's $150 per year. It used to be $200 every two years. There's the $20 sticker per tow vehicle. As we've discussed, if you have one license, you pay $150, it includes the $20 sticker. If you have two vehicles, you pay $150 plus $20 for the second tow vehicle. That isn't a change, but we just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that. Um, there is a new fee for the PPI endorsement of $50 a year. The issue that the drafting committee looked at was most of the concerns that are raised in the city involve 
the private party impound tows. So there was a decision to include a fee that's reflective of that increased work for the municipality um, for those types of tows. Uh, the second to the last bullet is that the same as that last comment is that there will be a new endorsement required for each tow operator that's engaging in private party impound tows. So if you are a private party impound tower, your annual fee would be $200 um, every year. The last bullet, it talks about clarifying fines and it specifically defines prohibited conduct in the new code. And that pretty much summarizes it. As you can see in the pages behind here, it goes into much more detail about those provisions. It's divided into section 9.54 and section 10.54, and it goes into some detail about those highlights. And that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, and I'm not sure if we open at this time, or would you like to present, Ms. Uh, Tucker, would you like to present some highlights under the code to uh, make sure that we have a good start? It's really good to open it okay. at this time, and then if there are some questions about um, uh, the history of what we've been doing here, things like that, then I'm happy to okay. uh, address those or any finite things. But Very good. Really there. They're, they're up. Very good. So this is the opportunity for to be uh, heard as far as the provisions of the ordinance There's to be changed. So we'd like to hear from the towing industry or those persons in the audience, the members of the public that would like to comment on uh, the changes to 9.54 and 10.54. So if you'd like to talk and give us some suggestions, some ideas, I want to let it be known clearly that this is an ordinance that was presented for introduction. It will be a public hearing, I believe, scheduled the 5th of November, and uh, just because you speak here today at this Public Safety Committee meeting does not preclude you from speaking at the public's uh, hearing uh, before the entire body of the Assembly, and I wanted you to know that this by no means is this ordinance uh, in firm concrete, that there may be, in fact, likely will be some amendments, and you might see what's called an S version, a substitute version of what we have presented um, for introduction. Mr. Trainee. Just to let you know that the meeting is on the 5th, which is a Wednesday. Because Election Day, we normally meet on Tuesday, but it's Election Day. So we did move it over to Wednesday. So, And it's the last item on the agenda on Wednesday. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Ms. Gray Jackson, anything? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hurt, Mr. Hall. Okay, so um, we'd love to hear from you some suggestions, some comments, some concerns, even criticisms. Certainly, if you'd like to speak to us, please just state your name so we can have that for the record. And if it's something that's going to be a really unique name uh, that might be difficult to spell, if you could see Ms. Uh, Kata Brown up front and we'll have you. And make sure, please, that you sign in so we can have a record of who's here today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Ransom. Um, I'm affiliated with the taxi industry, and I want to thank you. I really enjoy um, having the venue of the Public Safety Committee uh, meeting monthly that we can address our concerns to the assembly people. I think it's a lot more personal than those assembly meetings and uh, even when you have public hearings uh, they're so long and drawn out that it's very, for people working 12 hours plus a day it's very hard to attend your meetings and uh, testify. I understand this is about the towing and the changes in the title and regulating them. I want to uh, mention that please keep under consideration when you're making adjustments to an industry as you've done in Title 11 and took two years with uh, Title 11 and changing the uh, taxi and transportation ordinances uh, to strengthen the public safety so to speak and make it stronger contrary to popular belief that it was in our best interest. It was meant under the disguise of the public's best interest and to protect the public. And now when a multi-billion dollar company from out of state comes in, I see people tripping over themselves to throw the whole Title 11 out and make it exempt for out of state people to do business. I find that very uh, disturbing and um, as you're investigating another industry in our local community for public protection. Just keep that in mind when you're turning the screws to 
private individuals and that are paying all these fees, the commercial insurance, the, the local taxes, and go, jumping through all the hoops for public protection that you put on the taxi industry, and now you're going to do on the towing. Um, I've always found the towing as a commercial customer to be fair um, and uh, re very responsive. If they cannot pay their commercial insurance and, and their high vehicle fees, those things don't come cheap, um, then they're going to be out of business. So when you're protecting the public, understand you might be putting somebody out of business too. Thank you. Sorry, can you remember me? Anything? Okay, thank you, Ms. Ransom. I appreciate that um, for the comments. And I will, can only in summary speak that uh, we take the code very seriously and any adjustments there too. We don't always get it right when we put something together nor when we make amendments, but we, it, it is usually done and we like to think in this case um, after a lot of thoughtful consideration with a lot of input and that's why we're here today. So, please. Yeah, my name is Will Webb. I am a part owner of Webb's Towing. We've been in business in Anchorage for over 30 years. And I just had a couple questions. In the news the other day, they said that, uh, and I think it was Mr. Traney they were quoting as saying that there was 100 complaints. And I just wanted to know if they know, is that 100 complaints and how many impounds were done that we had 100 complaints? Is that 1%, 10%, or 100%? And my other question was, is on your rewrite and draft of this new ordinance, did you have anybody from the towing industry sitting on your committee and helping you write this? Or is this just a sleight of hand, let's just go and we're going to, you know, we're not up front, we're just going to make it and here it is. So I'm just kind of kind of curious and that's my two questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Training? I, I there was one. no one from the towing industry involved in it. This was done by our staff and our people. Okay. I, that's the purpose of having these meetings to get input from the get input from the industry. Ms. Tucker, we've been working on this since at least the last twenty years. Believe me, I know. Okay. I've been to all of them. Good, Ms. Tucker. Just to follow on um, with that, as um, I think you know, because you uh, helped us uh, in bringing input in two thousand and eleven, that this uh, this this. The work on this ordinance actually began in 2008 and was rolled forward uh, when Mr. Uh, Traney was uh, off the assembly for a year. Uh, so it was rolled forward to 2011 and we had uh, public safety meetings at uh, different locations and, and uh, that. And so we, I brought forward, because I've still been here, all of the input that uh, we got uh, uh, from that, and um, and so m much of what is in this ordinance uh, started with the uh, bare bones that we worked out in 2008, and then refined a little bit in 2011, and then brought forward. And then by by that time, we had a lot more data. And as you know, also in 2011, there was some some. Um, uh, concern there because uh, we wanted to make sure, as this ordinance does, to, to separate out uh, consensual tows from the uh, non-consensual and, and uh, private party impound tows. And that's for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that the rate setting for consensual tows is not the assembly's uh, jurisdiction or um, or uh, thrust of interest there. Whereas in the private party impound, um, back in 2011 when we were working on that, there was some confidence after um, speaking with members of the industry that that some self-policing and, you know, that the good operators, uh, and there are very, very many good operators like yourself, Mr. Webb, in that industry, that these things could, um, if we raise the awareness of them, they would the certain practices would uh, be self-policed and self-regulated, and that didn't turn out to to uh, be as satisfactory as we'd hoped it, it would be, those of us that were drafting it. And so when um, when Mr. Traney uh, renewed his interest in, and other people on the assembly in 2013 uh, 
brought it back in, then, then I brought forward all those files. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to echo what Ms. Tucker was saying. Uh, we did, for the, for the members that are here today, for the people that are here today, um, these ideas or suggestions didn't just come in a vacuum where we're sitting behind closed doors somewhere with staff. Staff is responsible for the rewrite of what you see in the document. Um, and we went through it literally line by line, very painstakingly. It was not done um, off of a knee jerk or shoot from the hip kind of process. It was very well thought of uh, at many, many meetings. Um, and, and believe me, uh, the commentary that we had built up with, Ms. Tucker was saying, from the earlier Public Safety Committee meetings, uh, all those notes were encompassed in, in the drafting of this ordinance. Now, that's not to say that we didn't miss something or that we misunderstood something. And that's why we have this meeting. Um, as well as public hearing on the actual ordinance, as, as you see it, was it come forward? So, on the fifth. So, thank so, but I guess as my first question, we don't know how many impounds have been done to have a hundred complaints, or what? We we don't know that that answer of because a hundred complaints out of ten thousand is a very small amount. A sure. uh, hundred out of a hundred is a big amount. So, I was just kind of curious if we sure. had any data on on that because at the work session the other day, I know that you guys listed some of the complaints, but I also noticed the dates were 2013, 2012, so that's one complaint a year. That, that's, that's pretty minute. So I was just wondering if there was any data on that, on that kind of... I don't know if the Ombudsman's Office has any numbers with them today as far as what I can see the head shaking, no. But uh, I, we can certainly inquire as to how many they may have inquired from. I can tell you that I get no less than a couple of a month where I've been making, getting complaints on. It's generally about rates. And the second part of it is how do they appeal uh, to the common, I guess you could say, to the good of uh, middle of the night, how do they pay for it, how, where do they go, and why is it costing me 400 or $500 as opposed to uh, during the daytime if I call for a tow, it might cost me 100 And it's usually those are the answers that I don't have other than, hey, look at the ordinance. The ordinance says you can go to the court. Um, if the fees are unreasonable, you should prevail. Um, otherwise, I always recommend that they contact the owner of the company the next business day. But uh, these, are, these are things that we're trying to address after numerous complaints that it goes on. Ms. Mosier has a question. Ms. I just wanted to share through the chair, you know, we, um, I shared some of the feedback and I wanted to share stuff over the years because I wanted to stress that it wasn't an isolated problem from 2014 that since I'd worked here for the assembly since 2010, we had been receiving complaints. So we did share complaints from the span of my, um, my history with the assembly department. But um, as far as specific number of complaints based on number of impounds, we do not have that, da that data in the clerk's office. Thank you. Ms. Tucker. I was just going to add a couple of things. One is that, the, that for the most part, um, the sense was that um, many of the things in this ordinance are things that operators do anyway, and our sense was to do right anyway, and that our sense was it was easier to, to would be easier for them if different requirements were consolidated in the in the code. Um, and so I'll give an example of that in a minute. And then the other point um, that I'd refer to is sometimes the 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 uh, concerns that the assembly asked us to address are are voiced in the newspaper from tow operators. So um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a tow operator um, that who you know was being interviewed by the by the uh, newspaper, who said, "Yeah, well, if a person comes to me, it might be a hundred dollars to to do a curb release, or it might be one hundred and twenty-five, or it might be one hundred and fifty. It just depends on you know their attitude, basically." And so, those were some of the practices that um, the assembly asked us to to look at and try and regulate. The example of, of a consolidation here is, is um, in the ordinance under the licensing requirements, the application requirements. In the um, prior code and in the practice, there are many things that the tow operator is responsible to do, insurance and a safety inspection and a, and a myriad of, of things. And so, 
um, and they were spread out in different places in the code. And so um, part of what the um, assembly in the clerk's office asked in the drafting is to make it so that the application can have a checklist and uh, and here's the package and so that we have them all in one spot and some of them are repeated again as requirements but still that when the tow operator comes in it's still the same mostly many uh, of the same requirements but they're in one package to submit so that they're um, is some consolidation there. Thank you, Ms. Tucker. And I will say that um, Ms. Tucker actually attended a national conference of municipal attorneys uh, and council and uh, actually gained a lot of knowledge after the 2011 uh, research and public testimony. And it was the industry that actually made uh, a commentary to myself and a couple other assembly members that stated that consensual toes parties agreeing when they make up the phone, pick up the phone and say, can you come tow my car? It's broke down on the side of the road. That the government had no, no business in that. It's de been deregulated under the federal and national level. And Ms. Tucker discovered that through her research and through attending this conference and came back. And that, again, uh, is encompassed in, in why we were moving. There, there will be no posting, if you will, of business rates. Um, that's a decision you make between you and your customer on a consensual basis. It's the non-consensual uh, is that we're addressing in the new uh, revision of the code. So, so you, can, you can charge up to a certain dollar amount. I think we'll discuss those as we go into the changes here. And that doesn't mean you, don't have, you have to charge that amount. It just means you can charge up to. And there's also pr some provisions for um, adjustments going forward. And, in fact, that's, uh, that's addressed in the code, too. So uh, is it, uh, Ms. Tucker, would you, uh, if we have anybody else that would like to come forward? No, we'd love to hear from you. Please, step forward. Come on down. My name is Barbara Weil, W-E-I-L, and I want to thank you for um, the email that you sent to me because I'm one of those um, citizens who uh, emailed you about my complaints for a circumstance that I was involved in regarding towing. So thank you for that. And as I, <clears throat> I just started reading the items that I picked up here, and I wanted to clarify in your ordinance whether or not you speak to certain items. The first is based, you know, primarily on my experience. When the tow occurred, there was a misunderstanding. I thought I had permission to park there. In fact, I didn't. Okay, I mean, it didn't. It turned out that there was a misunderstanding. So when we tried to contact the towing company, there was absolutely no way to talk to a real person. So there was no ability to negotiate when you were going to get your car back, how you were going to get it back, etc. So I was without a car and without knowledge of knowing when I was going to have my car back, under what circumstances. So therefore I couldn't plan. If that was, if I had to work that day, if I had a child that had to go to the hospital, etc., we can think of all kinds of scenarios where that would put a person at a significant disadvantage. So communication, number one. Secondly, we did not have the option to retrieve our car until almost two days later. So it was a Saturday night, and the first time we could retrieve it was business hours on Monday morning. So if you were working on that Monday and then you had to report late to work because you didn't have a car, there again is another un unintended consequence in addition to the fees that were paid. Thirdly, when we tried to figure out what we were going to have to pay in fees, there was no schedule. Not on the um, towers website, not on the municipal website. So we were, you know, it was when we walked in, it was like whatever the guy was going to charge us is what we were going to have to pay. End of story. And so when it comes down to a cap of 225 that's listed on your ordinance, if you know, there is a place that says late night charge release and all that kind of stuff, that wasn't even available to us. But is there going to be, like, uh, in certain circumstances, if it's a certain distance from a certain, then another add-on fee for that, or if you have blonde hair, is there a reduction, et cetera, et cetera. Or all these little hidden fees that come on when you actually get to the counter to pay for the fine that you owe or the impound fee. So I think that needs to be addressed. What are the contingencies? Is 225 really 225, or can you add mileage, time, time of day, what, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that needs to be spelled out. 
Um, so I talked about communication, I talked about add-on fees, um, and location of the fees that are published in a place that makes common sense to somebody that needs to know what those fees are before they get to those cars that have been impounded. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do the best we can to, uh, to address some of those today. In fact, I know that Ms. Jones and Mr. T uh, Traney has some comments you want to... Ms. Traney had issues. Oh, requires them to have a phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They've got to have somebody there to answer the phone. True. It was an answering service who said, can't help you, can't help you, can't help you. Hmm? They have to have a human there to answer the phone, not a machine. I know, but if the person can't help you, what different, you know, was, we're an answering service. I can't help you. Okay. I mean. Ms. Tucker and Ms. Jones. That's a workaround. Okay. Um, what we did to, what the drafters did to address that at, at the request of the assembly and based on uh, circumstances like, like yours was several things. Uh, so one is that um, there are normal office hours, seven days a week. Is that right? Am I right? Six. And so, and that's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So um, a person has to be available those hours. There's a 24-hour number, which could be an answering uh, service, service uh, outside of those hours. But um, tow operators are encouraged to uh, and, are, and are allowed to charge, one of the very few add-on fees that they are allowed to charge is a fee for after-hours access. They don't have to allow after hours access, but if they do allow after hours access, then they then there's a fee that's allowed to be added on to that 225. And then um, moving into your question about fees, the 225 is the um, tow rate, and to that there are only uh, one or two allowed charges and those are spelled out in the ordinance so those hidden fees are, that you were subjected to those are really um, as a matter of, of uh, legal interpretation those are fines and penalties that are prohibited so the add-on fees as I said one was uh, after hours uh, access a $50 fee a mileage fee and that one we've already the uh, uh, Drafters have already gotten feedback from the assembly that at the work session, people uh, were concerned that the add-on for a mileage surcharge over 20 miles may not have been high enough. So I'm just repeating what, what the testimony was at the work session. So, so but there is a, 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 a fuel surcharge that's allowed uh, in the present ordinance. And then there is an, a one, there's a one-time free access that uh, at the next business, you know, the next normal hour day that you get to come and retrieve things like your wallet and I mean the purpose is so that people can retrieve vital things, prescriptions, uh, identification without having to uh, make, a, you know, additional arrangements. And then after that single access fee, then they're allowed to charge an access fee, I think, also of $50 um, if you're coming back, uh, you know, more than, than that uh, one time. And, uh, and then storage charges are laid out in the ordinance uh, for, based on how m many days that you leave your car there. Um, I'm not clear on a couple of things then. So all these add-ons that you just talked about, that's in addition to the 225. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So and when you talked about the um, normal business day, if, if, is Sunday a normal business day? I mean, if you're towed on a Sunday, can you not pick up your car on a Sunday? Um, the ordinance provides that... Uh, defines for purposes of the tow ordinance a normal 
I mean, a um, normal business hours. And those hours are seven days a week from six to six. So in other words, if your car was towed at night, you should have the option to go and pick it up the next day. Yes. Yes, because otherwise, as you have pointed out, and many other uh, uh, complaints and feedback uh, we got is that your storage charges and uh, access to vehicles um, is prevented if your car is towed on a Friday and the tow operators don't happen to work on the weekend. Then that's a deprivation of of your property with no recourse. And so exactly. that's one of the things that is addressed specifically in the ordinance. Okay. So there's so in the ordinance and in the statement of fees, you will see all the additional a fuel charge, a this charge, a distance charge, a storage charge, a late night charge, in addition to the two twenty five. That will be spelled out. Yes, because part of the um uh, consumer bill of rights for uh, tow consumers and part of the ordinance requires that the fees be posted uh, and laid out and so we had um, we had feedback from uh, through the ombudsman of situations where a person wasn't even allowed to see their charges until they paid for them precisely yeah and so that has to be you have to the, those have to be disclosed and identified. Well, you were not even able to see them. You just had to said the guy says you owe this much amount of money, put it on the desk and get your car or never mind. Those are your options. Right. And so one other option that that this addresses uh, uh, at the request of of the assembly was that that if the tow operator accept whatever forms of payment the tow operator uh, accepts at the storage and impound yard, be it a debit card or credit card or cash, wh whatever those are, then also um, in the curb release or uh, on scene release situation, uh, those same forms of payment need to be accepted there because. Uh, akin to the things that you have brought up, the assembly was, uh, as Mr. Honeman said, you know, c complaints coming in uh, sort of routinely that I could, o I was there, I uh, my car was being towed away, it hadn't been hooked up, but I was supposed to go and get this much cash in this amount of time, and they only took cash payment. And so it's not a requirement that any form of payment be uh acceptable. It said if it's accepted at the place of business, it has to be accepted at the time of the tow also. Okay. The one last point I'd like to clarify based on what you told me about an answering service. The answering service would have to be able to give you information about the things that you just mentioned, where to go, when to go, what's available, how to find the rates, not just, hello, I'm taking messages, I can't give you any information. Yeah, I think that that's, a, that's a important. And if it's not in there now, I think that that's a very good comment. What is in the code now is that the signs uh, from where uh, your vehicle has been towed have to give the location and, uh, of the tow operator. And the tow operator's air, that location also has to give appropriate signage uh, so that you can find it. And uh, and identify it when you get there with um, with pertinent information disclosed. Thank you. Because actually, I didn't bring that up, but you did. It was very hard to find the lot the following that dark, cold Monday morning. Very hard. Thank you, Mr. Jones, Mr. Trini. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to add a couple of things to Miss Tucker's explanation. Um, one of the items that was also addressed in the um, proposed ordinance is that sometimes when people couldn't get to their car, that the storage fees don't start for 24 hours. So mm. if you get your car towed on a Saturday and you pick it up on Sunday, there's not a storage charge if you pick it up within 24 hours. So that's one thing that was added. 
I also just wanted to check and clarify that the, the fuel surcharge is authorized I believe only if the assembly doesn't take action to raise the cons non-consensual tow rate after five years. Is that no? The fuel surcharge is no. The fuel surcharge is there, and then there's an automatic CPI index that, that I think okay. that you're thinking. All right. About. Five years. But but talk about that. Oh. You, you want to finish your thought about about the how that CPI index works? Uh, no, I'll let you come back to that one. Okay, the one thing that I wanted to let this speaker know that I think is important with all the options that Ms. Tucker mentioned and that the Assembly asked us to include, the tow operators are required to give consumers the Consumer Bill of Rights regarding towing at their first contact with the, with the citizen. So, for example, if you walk out and see your car being towed, the tow operator is to give the citizen a tow, the consumer bill of rights regarding towing. If you contact the tow operator and go to their place of business, they're supposed to give you that consumer bill of rights regarding towing. So one of the protections that happens is the goal is that you're going to get that on your first contact with the tow operators. You're going to be able to open it and take a look at it, and all of the information that Ms. Tucker just explained would be in that Consumer Bill of Rights regarding towing. So you would know this information. If your rights are violated, what is the citizen's recourse? Um, if, may I answer that, Mr. Yes, Chair? Yes, um, The citizen's recourse in the code, it specifies that you have a right to file a complaint in court. You can go to a court. And it does specify that a citizen could get a refund of the tow charges and also treble damages. Thank you. And, and, and Mr. Traney had a follow-up. Quick question for you. When you did go get your car, what form of payment did you have to give them? Did they say cash only, or do they take other forms of payment? They took credit cards. They did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bray Jackson? Mr. Mm -hmm. Peterson? Mr. Steele? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your information. I hope we answered your questions. Uh, and just so you know, there are, um, there are still this, – this ordinance is still – in draft form, and there will, um, particularly in the area of perhaps uh, distance or the fuel surcharge addition, uh, may be amended or adjusted. I know there's at least one suggestion come from one of our colleagues on the assembly. Ms. Tucker. I just had one add-on uh, in terms of recourse. So um, uh, I interpreted your question, I think, uh, uh, and I think uh, Mrs. Jones did – Ms. Jones did also – uh, as what your your personal recourse uh, is, and in addition to your personal recourse, uh, the clerk's office has made arrangements for um, staffing of an additional enforcement officer. And uh, under this ordinance, um, uh, certain violations, which are spelled out. Uh, at the back of the ordinance, and you may want to take a look at those, are subject to fines. And the, the city uh, and the administrative hearing officer that handles Title X violations uh, can't be a court of recourse to an individual. But in order to assist um, in clarifying the ordinance, the actual violations are spelled out with fines attached. Now, prior to this ordinance, uh, violations were just grouped uh, and covered in a separate section of uh, the municipal code. They were under uh, Chapter 10.10 .10, um, or 10.05, and it said that any violations of the licensing were subject to this, uh, uh, were subject to a $500 fine, and that each day of violation was a separate fine. But it was uh, difficult for enforcement because the clerk's office didn't have a, uh, uh, there weren't enough enforcement officers to enforce Title 10. And for um, APD enforcement, which is also an alternative, 
um, it was hard for APD to sort of locate that because it's not on the usual schedule. So the different violations of both 9.54, which is how towing needs to be done, and 10.54, which is the licensing requirements, are now scheduled out in the back of that um, ordinance under um, Title 14 on the fine schedule. So it may not help you as an individual directly if you're subject to a tow and you still need to pursue that as a, as a separate action, but it does um, encourage uh, tow operators uh, to comply with some of the things that should have always been complied with because there's more enforcement in there at the direction of the assembly. And, and I'd like to thank you, Ms. Well, for, uh, for your comments and your questions, and hopefully we'll get more information to you before the meeting is over, and perhaps follow up if you have any other questions. Please feel free to contact uh, either the clerk's office or any of the municipal assembly members, um, including this committee. You can find our information on the website as well at muni.org if you haven't gotten any phone numbers directly. Um, are, are there any other persons here that would like to testify? Because I want to try to do the timing. Um, okay, I see one, two, three. Four, five, okay, there's quite a few. So we'll, let's just do this moving forward from here. Um, if you can make your comments known, we'll take note, and that way um, we can allow everybody to get their comments in, and then we might be able to answer those better uh, because we might have some repeat questions from everyone. So, ma'am, you were first to step up. Please feel free. Give us your name. And uh, yeah, I am a volunteer at the courthouse once a month and left in... Uh, last summer. Can we get can we get your name, oh, please? I'm sorry, no. <laughs> Phyllis Stolten. Um, we have permission to. We had permission to park in the courtyard inn, which is a very small place about a block away from the courtyard, a courthouse. Uh, so I uh, parked there for uh, four hours or three hours, three and a half, something like that, and came back to find my car gone. Uh, I went into the courtyard inn and found there was a new manager there who knew, knew nothing about it. It had been posted, but I thought, well, I'm okay because I have permission. Anyway, I took a cab out to the tow place and was told it was $175. That was an expensive three and a half hours. I was given no information. Uh, I said, $175? And she said, well, if you want to leave it here, it's another $100 a day. <laughs> so I was not, you know, of course, too happy. Uh, but of course, I paid the money, having no other option. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if I had any recourse anywhere. And also, um, on another occasion, I went to the Beartooth for an 8 o'clock show, and I went to park, and there's a huge parking lot across the street, which is entirely empty because it's been posted. But none of these businesses are open, so why can't anybody park there? <laughs> um, I didn't. And... I guess that would be all of what I have to say right now. Okay. And we will definitely address those if you can stay for just a few moments. We'll, uh, we'll see if we can get some answers to you. Just so you know, private person's impound in general is when someone is parked on someone's, uh, someone else's property, their private property. And it could be public property, but generally it's the private property of another. And um, you're found to be either in, posted, in violation of the postings or uh, in conflict of what the business is trying to get done with their their own property. So they have contracted with tow operators to move the vehicles. All right. Sir. Yes, hi. My name is Art Vidrine, Area Wide Towing. Uh, Vidrine is V-I-D-R-I-N-E. First a comment and then a couple of uh, specifics regarding the regs. Um, I think if you took a polling of all of the tow operators in this town of how many PPIs they do per month and then gathered up the number of complaints that you receive each month. I, I believe strongly that the percentage would be very low, like one to two percent. So uh, in a sense, it feels like you're kind of punishing a whole industry for a very small number of complaints. 
and, and rewarding uh, the, those people who intentionally park where they aren't supposed to. Um, having said that, um, I am aware that there have been instances of companies overcharging for PPIs, um, non-consensual tows. Uh, I don't have a problem with a capped rate. I have a problem with the 225 that you're proposing. Um, last week in the meeting, somebody, one of the presenters said that they conducted some research nationally and came up with the 225. Um, it's too low for Anchorage. Uh, I mean, I think it should be around $300. And again, capped is fine. I don't care if we can't add on any other fees. It just needs to be reasonable given that the cost of doing business in Anchorage is much higher than elsewhere in the country. Um, I conducted some research actually three years ago, almost to this day, and submitted a report to this committee and to the assembly and the clerk's office uh, showing that the rates in this town are too low, not only for PPIs, but for APD rates. We're half of what uh, the rest of the country gets to charge for, for APD rotational tow type rates. But in any event, uh, the cost of doing business here is extremely expensive. 225 is too low. Please reconsider that rate. Uh, the next item I have is um, normal business hours. Again, we're on the APD t rotational tow program. They require us to have normal business hours of eight to five Monday through Friday. So with you imposing something different, six to six, um, again, it's you're, you're kind of punishing us and increasing our cost of doing business because now we have to staff more hours than we normally would have to. Why not just make it the same as the APD requirement, eight to five Monday through Friday? Um, my company does uh, do releases on weekends, holidays, sometimes at night. I mean, we, I, I know that the regs don't require that, um, and, and I, I don't think that they should. I think if a tow company wants to close their doors at 5 o'clock and be done till 8 the next day, they should be able to. Next item, um, this one is, is specifically uh, Section 10.54.030. Um, you removed the language uh, for, uh, if applicable, after Alaska State commercial driver's license. I think that was probably unintentional on your part, uh, or whoever was drafting this. I don't believe that you're intending that all tow operators and their drivers in this town have to have a commercial driver's license. For example, uh, DMV and USDOT and AKDOT, uh, they require a driver to have a commercial driver's license if the vehicle, the gross vehicle weight, is in excess of 26,000 pounds, if they're carrying hazardous materials, and if they are driving a passenger or school bus. None of those applies to 99.9% .9 of the tow companies in this town. Um, for example, we have four trucks, two, two of them are wreckers that weigh 7,500 pounds each, far below the 26,000 pound requirement for a CDL. We also have two car carriers or rollbacks or slidebacks. Um, they weigh 14,000 pounds, again, far below the, the requirement. So I, I, I ask you to revisit that clause that you've removed um, because I don't think your intention was for all tow drivers to have a commercial driver's license. Mr. Um, Green, yeah, uh, you've been upon four minutes, and so I'm trying to do this uh, equal, but you may have questions, or yeah. I may have you just summarize if you, if you got one more point. Yeah, one item, and I'm sure. done. Sure. Um, the other item is the 30 minute rule for uh, curb release. Um, the way I read it, if a person approaches us as we're hooking a vehicle, um, we have to sit there and wait 30 minutes. If, so they could go inside and sit inside and it's 20 below and wait 29 minutes and come back out and either choose to pay us for the curb release or not and then, and then we drive off. That just seems kind of unfair to make a driver have to sit there for, for 30 minutes. Um, that was it. Okay, well, before you leave, I may have some questions here from my colleagues here. Mr. Mr. Hall? Mr. Steele? Ms. Gray Jacks? Mr. Traney? Okay, um, I, I have... I have uh, made copious notes on some of your suggestions. Uh, some of them seem fairly reasonable. The curb release um, comments, I am definitely interested in trying to hear. I, I know there's some of my colleagues that are concerned about, uh, you know, onerous imposition on a, on a tow operator uh, for the purposes of the curb release. So it's a good idea, good suggestions. Um, and I'm intrigued about the Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 versus 6 to 6, 7 days a week. 
Uh, I can tell you in general that the chief of police did not want the general tow provisions to look or mirror or in, imitate anything that looked like a contract with he does not want, mm -hmm. frankly, he does not want uh, the rotational tow contracts to be generally associated with with the non-consent towing. It's We stand alone on that. And I, and I understand where he's coming from. He doesn't want to get the industry coming to him saying, you know, you need to drive your rates up so we can get other rates tied higher at the other end. He doesn't want, he wants them to be two separate issues. And I, I concurred with that because I believe it's a appropriate way to go. Ms. Jones, you have any comments or questions? Mr. Honeman, I think that the drafting committee struggled with normal business hours, but one of the um, repeated complaints and concerns was that people need to get to work, and I think that the assembly and municipality are pretty supportive of getting people to work, but if your car's been towed on a Friday night and you can't retrieve it until 8 o'clock on Monday morning, and if you work 8 to 5, it's going to cause you a problem. But I think the drafting committee would be interested in hearing your comments. And if we could even talk offline and collect some of those, that might be helpful for us. So my question in general then, and speaking um, for myself, Mr. Traney and I, we've worked real hard with the drafting committee. And that is that just that uh, if, if we were to allow that in the ordinance, 8 to 5 Monday through Friday, it would have to be a fairly soft provision for someone to pick up their vehicle over a weekend. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to say it. I think the obvious is tow violations occur seven days a week. And I know you have operators that are working seven days a week, so they have to go into the yard mm -hmm. to put the vehicle there. Could they also then be allowed to let the vehicle be released? You know, yes. regardless of your timeline, yeah. perhaps, but it has to be a very soft provision for that. Yeah, and we do, we do that, but okay. not everybody does. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Daryl Thompson. I'm an attorney here in town. And uh, some of the tow companies have asked me to speak to a little bit about this. And I feel a little bad that I didn't uh, know about this earlier in terms of being representative and didn't come to a work session. I think maybe so, uh, I have a lot of detailed comments. I'm going to try to broad brush them and, and not do that today because I know we're limited on time. But, uh, you know, the last speaker, I think, brought up uh, excellent points, all of which were brought up uh, by the clients that I met prior to coming here today. And it first starts off with uh, the definition of normal uh, working hours. And it's one thing to regulate uh, what happens to the consumer. It's another thing to flip that all around and, and completely uh, change the working model that many of the tow companies have. Um, I've spoken to all the ones that I've spoken with, and they're all like 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. Um, and this is going to radically change the way they do business. They're going to have to be seven days a week, 12 hours a day, instead of five days a week, you know, eight to five or nine to five. And um, that has a direct financial impact on the way they operate their business. And I, I just have to say, in terms of trying to correlate some of the other information that was uh, just made available, and it's in the proposed ordinance of not charging for the first 20 hour or four hours of storage if um, you don't have an on-call. And it, I don't know why that would be there if the anticipation of normal business hours includes Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, if you... Why would you get free storage if you are working every day, seven days a week? It's available for someone to pick up seven days a week, 12 hours a day. That, that doesn't make sense to me. And when I uh, read the definition of normal business hours, it doesn't say seven days a week. It just says six to six, silent on the issue of whether or not it's seven days a week. So the people that I met with actually assumed it meant Monday through Friday, but we're just going to have to expand our hours. And we come here today to learn that it's not just Monday through Friday. It's actually every day of the week. Uh, you know, I don't know that I necessarily have the, the answer, but I hear you're talking about some soft answers. I mean, we've got, we've got to have something in there that balances the interest of the consumer being able to get it. The tow truck drivers, as the one just here and the ones that I represent, have all indicated to me they allow people to come 24-7, give them a call, they go, they meet. It's appropriate that you put a cap on that fee. That makes sense. Um, all supportive of that, but that certainly is the balance to the weekend. Um, and uh, and I, I don't think any of them are supporting a 12-hour-a-day uh, work week and having to staff the office 12 hours a day, even if it's a Monday through Friday. Um, we, uh, the, some of the examples that were given uh, with respect to the, uh, the rate, the cap of 225, um, 
you know, it may, it may work under some circumstances, but one of the problems is, is that it all depends upon what it is you're towing. I mean, if you're towing a semi and it's a private party impound, um, you don't have the luxury of having a key, or if it's a, uh, it's a Winnebago and you don't have the luxury of having a key, you know, your risk to you as a business owner of having to put that big piece of equipment on the back of your vehicle and tow it, and it's a lot more time, energy, and work, and uh, the 225 is not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, I know we're not supposed to go to the rotational uh, contract, but you know, even that recognizes different size rigs cost businesses more. It's more risk to you when you're having a more expensive, bigger rig, and so we don't believe that that 225 is an appropriate cap, and it may be that it's not a one-size-fits-all you ought to structure in terms of the gross tonnage or the gross weight of the vehicle. Um, and uh, we also are here to just echo, and not to totally repeat, but that uh, we think that it was probably an oversight with respect to not including the as applicable on a CDL. Uh, I don't think this body was attempting to, by uh, um, amending this, to now require what DOT does not require on terms of drivers, um, and that too has a logical basis in the regulatory body of uh, Department of Transportation in terms of who does and does not in terms of gross tonnage of the vehicles in which they're operating. And so we, we would not support uh, eliminating, if applicable, we would encourage that it uh, continue to be in there. I. Um, with respect to the fuel chart, I know you've already heard something about this. You know, people give normal examples of, uh, gee, if I got to go from Girdwood here, you know, I'm kind of going upside down when I'm, you know, it's not quite a tank, you're not getting, uh, you know, gallons per mile, but some of these bigger rids when you're towing a bigger vehicle, it's going to cost you, you're going to be upside down on your fuel charge. You're just going to, I mean, you know, you're capping it at two twenty-five dollars right? Two twenty-five, twenty-two dollars fifty cents. So you're capping it, and yet that fuel is going to cost you a lot more if you're going a longer distance. And so we don't think, I think that does need to be addressed. Um, one of the things that I noted when reading through all of this is it wasn't entirely clear to me um, what the standard of proof was going to be in terms of the imposition of fines. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're like a traffic fine where it's strict liability, or if there is some uh, mental intent behind it, uh, willful, intentional, negligent, or something like that, knowing um, some, some level of intent, um, it, it seemed would be incongruous if uh, you would apply a strict liability to all of these things without having some intent behind them. Um, Mr. Thompson, I, I've just you know, I've given you a little bit more time because you're representing uh, groups, but coming up on a six-minute market, we may have some more some questions from you from the body. But is that summarize. the big boot you're cutting me off? Could I just have you summarize if you could? I know. I have one more thing. Yes, please. And that has to do with the private person impound and the ordering of events. First thing you do is need to initiate, uh, prior to doing anything, uh, a call to the police department to obtain an incident number. And you know that's contrary to the protocol that's been in place. It's within an hour of having towed, and and I don't know the answer to this. And maybe internally, and you guys have staffed all this. Certainly, the people in the field. You know, it's one more thing to put on the list of having to do. Um, I don't know if you staff that through uh, APD, and if that's something that their impound department wants to have to staff and manpower and, and do, have extra people on the front end and the back end, because all this is impacting and we have a lot of other things that are out there. And I have a lot more to say and I just wish I would have been at the work session. We may have some comments here or some questions. Uh, Ms. Bray Jack. Mr. Steele. Uh, certainly do submit those to us though, so that we have them and don't we'll lose out on them. Thank yeah. you. And Ms. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's exactly what I was going to ask. We would like to hear your comments and suggestions. If it's not going to work, I think um, the drafting committee's role is to make this work for the assembly. So we would like to hear that. Your other comments? Very good. I'll put it in writing. I do, I do have them all highlighted, and I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and I want to you, say again, thank you for, I know you got in late in the game as far as not yeah. being able to make the work session, so you may take some time to review the ordinance. Um, one of the things, one of the primary reason we're here is because it is an ordinance that is in draft, or not in draft, it's been presented, and we are drafting a uh, uh, substitute or S version currently with some suggestions of our colleagues. So we would love to be able to incorporate um, from both the industry and the community. Uh, so th this is going to be an ordinance that works for the community, not just for the tow industry, not just for the assembly, but for the community. So we appreciate that. 
I do want to clarify a little advice you gave to the citizen earlier. You talked about trouble damages being available. I think that was, yeah, it's only available if you're overcharged. Not for any of the other violations. A right, right. We, we know there's some specific. Okay, I just wanted to clarify because you had said trouble damages were available, but okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Anyone else, please? Thanks for listening. I'm Gaylene Laracou, I'm the general manager of Area Wide Towing. First of all, in 2011, the version when Ms. Tucker was there, when we were doing the work session, one of the reasons that a lot of the tow operators were optimistic was because there was flexibility. I work in the office, and I don't think um, I don't think what's been taken into consideration in a lot of this is how much time goes into preparing for the tow, making it legal, documenting it, charging correctly, filing all the reports, keeping in compliance, paying all the insurance bills, workers' compensation, safety issues are huge. We pay a lot of money for safety. So I think that one thing that needs to be considered here is how much it costs us to run the company, not just towing and uh, storage in terms of administrative fees. We're told that we can't, in city and state ordinance now, we're not allowed to charge an admin fee. Uh, DMV says when we sell it, we can't charge anything um, in terms of our tow liens except the towing and storage. But we have hundreds of hours that goes into the administrative and paperwork and the law-abiding things that we have to pay for. And that's not a consideration. We're not, in, um, we're not remunerated for that, for keeping these vehicles all this time. One thing that I see, and I don't think it's been addressed here, is the nature of what we do as tow operators has changed, particularly when it comes to parking enforcement. Years ago, I've been in the business now for about five and a half years, and the nature of the tows have changed a lot. The economy has changed a lot. And what I see is the people are not returning to pick up their vehicles. They leave them, they know that they're not worth the reasonable price of our services. So we are upside down. So one of the things that we're trying to take care of now, and what I would like to see happen, is compliance by the vehicle owners. There is state and city laws that say that abandoning your vehicle anywhere is against the law and there's a fine. Now, if those people were made to comply, they're the ones who left it, we can prove it. If they don't come and pay for it, they should have their driver's license suspended. They need to take care of it. They're the ones who have uh, caused the vehicle to be towed. Generally, those kinds of things, they're, they know they're not supposed to be parking where they are, et cetera. And what we've seen now is the value of what we're picking up is far, far changed. That most of these, val these vehicles are not worth it. When does a vehicle change from an asset to a liability? And I've watched over the last five years, most of what gets picked up travel from asset to liability. I don't know if how aware you are of the DMV's reinterpretation of um, titling impound and sale vehicles. The law did not change, but their interpretation of it did. And now we are being asked to keep them twice as long. We have to double up on certified letters. Um, the cost is wild, so we're upside down. Now, if they don't come for the vehicles, and no one helps put a bite in the compliance of these ROs, the people who own these vehicles, we can prove that they are theirs. DMV can prove that they're theirs. What happens to us is we're getting nothing for this. So in order to survive, we have to charge for people that pay. That's the deep pockets and the whole theory of it. So. My feeling is that if you want to see the income stream and we want to divide this up and balance it, it would help if we made those people comply because no one, they know that no one's going to make them pay for them. So I think that is one of the most important things that we could do right now is make them comply. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a complaint. Um, as far as hours go, since I see that, the previous version that we saw in 2011, I was encouraged. I was one of the people that came in and spoke to you guys and to her. And at that time, I was told by the members who, of the assembly who were there that the new law would not be sandbagged. We wouldn't get sandbagged with it. And here we are three years later, and I have 31 pages to go through. And we could have done this all along the way, but 
when Mr. Traney said we couldn't get the right people together till now, that's exactly right. Because the right people have not been represented here. We have just as much or more authority. Um, we have, I can tell you that my company has not participated in any predatory or price gouging. Not at all. In fact, the sad part is, is how many people thank me that we picked their car up instead of letting them drive drunk? And many reasons we don't release vehicles at night. This is what everybody leaves out. No one's going to make me um, take a risk with my safety or the safety of my drivers if someone is drunk, hostile, and in the middle of the night, we shouldn't have to do that. The previous version, as far as hours and that kind of thing goes, we should, uh, I think it's fine to set hours on the weekend. We had some uh, flexibility. As long as we were allowed people to come for so many hours on Sunday and so many hours on Saturday, we could choose that, but those, those were those times. That's a lot better. Seven to, uh, six to six, seven days a week, that's killer. Um, as far as and it, everything else that I have to say does have to do with safety, the curb release that's dangerous. Um, the way it is worded right now, so okay, you know. the way it's, the curb releases are done now in here, if you read it carefully, it says the tow truck driver is entirely responsible for the safety of him driving away. And because that's the only time that, pe that we can get paid, he's going to jump in the truck and the, if you actually look at it, it's encouraging the citizens to run at a moving vehicle. And that, if it's the assembly's law, then you guys are going to be the ones that they're going to blame. So that needs to be changed. That needs to be more flexible. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to say is please understand that, that it's a kind of a towing legend, the you swore at me fee. That's kind of a joke. I thought it was hilarious when I first saw it. Every one of these things that deals with something, I've heard that legend of that one time that it happened. We've never... What they're trying to say is, we deserve respect too. I would be mad if someone towed my vehicle and there was a misunderstanding. It, that's always the case. And we try to treat everyone with respect. They should be expected to treat us with that. The law requires, we are protecting our client's property rights. So we, if we're put in that situation, we're just providing a service. It is the assemblies, it is a municipal code that made all of those fire lanes happen in the first place. Um, so, uh, um, so with, with, your, with your suggestions, Ms. Larkin, if you would, please, we would love to see those. I don't know if anybody, I know that you sent an email or contacted me and I, I owe you a call back. But uh, if you can get that to all of us, uh, we'd be very grateful because uh, we need to get some of the input to, uh, in order to craft or adjust for the S version. And okay. it, did you, and you summarize pretty much? You no, know, that's, I, there, there's so many things because it was so big. Sure. So, in having more time, because if it's taken, since 2008 to get here, I want more than 30 days. Anything? Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I was wondering, you've said that many times the vehicles you tow are, don't have as much value as the cost of the towing, so you end up getting stuck with the vehicle. Um, and so did you have a relationship with a company that auctions these vehicles off, or what's the procedure? How do you, how, how are you legally able to uh, get rid of these vehicles? That, and that's a very good point. That's what I want to say, is that the timing here of this year with DMV, their requests, they require us to keep it. If I brought it in and, and I had a vehicle towed in and I gave them certified letters that are the, the lowest amount of time I could keep it is 50 days. Your um, proposal here says that after, when I get to a month, it's 500, that's a cap on my storage. So anybody that I tow, if they want two weeks of free storage, they just leave it there because it's going to drop it in half. Um, and DMV is requiring us to keep them that long. I can't do 30 days and let them know um, your vehicle, I, we have your vehicle, it's, it's going to be, if you don't pick it up, it's going to be towed, for, I mean it's going to be um, auctioned for the towing price on such and such a date or after, and DMV won't let us do that now. Two letters, notice of the date it's going to be sold, and if we, Lord forbid, the paper doesn't come back from the post office, 
we have to send out another 20-day letter and wait another 20 days. So getting rid of these vehicles is a problem. And motorhomes, there's a perfect example. You can't, we can't get rid of them. Uh, the local AMR that does the metal recycling and so forth, those places aren't even accepting those anymore. So we've got, I want you to consider that a vehicle is tons of garbage. And when the vehicle crosses over from an asset to a liability, the people who are responsible for it are not us. It's the registered owner. And if I take the vehicle, and I have a legal reason to take it, a lot of the AP details are like that. I have tons of safe keeps in my yard now that nobody comes back for. No one checks to see if they have insurance. They want to come in and think about the fact that I'm letting them, they get to come in and get their stuff out. They know they're not coming back to pay for it. Okay. So who is? Yeah. Thank you. We'd Thank love you. to hear that. i would specific interest in the DMV interpretation, who I could contact there for. Thank I you. I think that that needs a work, I mean, that really needs to be explained so you can see how convoluted it is because it puts a pinch on us so badly that pretty soon, there's, and there's going to be vehicles everywhere. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Please. So that everybody can be heard, we're at about 117. I know we do have another um, explanation or presentation here too, so we'd love to be able to hear from everybody. So if we can try to get your information in, and, and please, I'm encouraging, if you have any suggestions or thoughts, please contact us. We need to hear from you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Theodore Bluford. I am the general manager of AK Towing. I just want to touch a few subjects real quick that are a great concern uh, for my company and the safety of my drivers, more importantly. Um, there's a couple things here. First off, the free on-site release uh, suggestion that you have in here. Um, all that's going to do is encourage people to continue to park illegally. They know if they come out in time, they can get the car back for free, they're going to do it again. That's not fair to property owners. Property owners have the right to enforce the parking rules of their property. And if we can't do anything about it, we're not a warning system. They hire us because we're a last resort. They've already done post the signs. They've already gave notifications to tenants if it's that kind of situation. They hire us because they can't get these rules enforced verbally. So they hire us to do this job. If we can't be a profitable company, we won't do these impacts. And then that's gonna leave property owners stuck getting fines because people are parking illegally. And nobody can come out to get these because we can't operate giving cars back for free, waiting 30 minutes for them to go get $50, having to do the reporting on scene, which causes safety issues. My driver's gotta sit there, he's gotta wait for a call back. He's got to wait 30 minutes for people to get $50. They can be calling their buddies to come to do whatever they want to do. That's a big issue. It's, it's not feasible. Um, one of the requirements that you guys have for licensing, there's a couple issues actually. One is a list of all of our drivers and their endorsements as far as licensing and stuff goes. I don't really understand why the Muni needs that on file. Um, if there's an issue, a particular issue can be addressed, that particular issue, I don't understand why you need to know who our staff is. Um, pictures. Do you guys want pictures of signage on properties? Our company alone has over 300 properties we manage. That's a lot of pictures. Some of these properties have 40, 50 signs on them. That's a lot of resources coming out of pocket from the company. I really think you need to reconsider that and handle them on a case by case basis and not put that kind of headache on companies. Um, we really need to think about the property owners and managers that try to get these properties, uh, multi-living housing areas, trailer park areas, um, and even businesses adjacent to other businesses like, for instance, Bear Tooth, Moose's Tooth. Um, some of this needs to be more consumer friendly as far as the, the tow industry is concerned, um, making people more accountable for their actions, um, having to give a verbal warning to somebody that's park, parking in there if, if we have to watch a parking lot because that's the only way to tell whether people are parking illegally because it's not a residential area, it's a business area, the business is closed. These owners don't want people parking in their parking lots, littering in their parking lots, hanging out in their parking lots. It's their right. Only way we can monitor it for sure is watch it. The signs are their warning. 
Why should we have to give them another warning? Again, we're not there as a warning service. We're there as an affirmative action. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Uh -oh. How you doing? The My name is Max Riggs. Away. Okay, you can you next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Go ahead. Most things have been addressed by my colleagues. Can I get your name, sir? Name? Max Riggs. Thanks. Good. On the hours of operation, I was kind of thinking that the APD rotation set at 8 to 5. And if you're going to do PPIs in the town, that you offer an after hours release. It just make that mandatory instead of having to staff an office 12 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're going to do impounds, make them offer an after hours release. I think that would be more fair to all the towers. If you're going to be in the PPI game, uh, we offer that service. I don't think that's too much to ask. The curb release, um, as far as when a curb release, I, I really had concerns about that. We've always pretty much accepted once it's been picked by a wheel lift or up on the deck of a truck, it's a curb release. And then you're making a driver standby for 30 minutes. I mean, you, you could tie up a driver for an hour and a half on a call like that and not make a dime. Um, as far as extra people having to be put on, I mean, you realize you put a person on for a year, you're probably looking at a $35,000 increase in your output with no income coming in to cover that. As far as insurance, um, I saw some concerns there. The state minimums, I've got my stuff quite in excess of the state minimums. Um, I got with my insurance lady, she said to come to the minimums that you are now proposing would probably increase mine about $800. And that's on top of the $85,000 that I pay out a year. So I guess why are the PPI proposals over what the APD requirements are on insurance? And that's pretty much, we've got Daryl taking care of some other things for us. There's a lot of things I'd like to cover. I'll probably do it more in an email fashion. Thanks for your time. No, thank you. Uh, we may have some questions. Mr. Trent? Ms. Granger? Okay. Ms. Jones? Oh, Ms. Jones? I have a question for you. If I understood you to say that if, if the company was just doing PPI in pounds, that the code could just require them to have an after hours release. Is that I think correct? so. And so if that was something that the assembly would consider, what would the cost of the after hours release be? Just the Well you guys have set the after hour releases up at fifty dollars. Okay, so it would be the for example, the two twenty five for the tow plus the after hours release. So as it's written right now, then it would be 275. So anybody that's doing PPI impounds just has to have after hours release. I think that's more realistic than making a company stay open 12 hours a day and staff that office. Okay. I, I've heard a lot of complaints from you know customers. Um, we use our own people. My people answer the phones 24 seven. I don't use an answering service. Tried that, doesn't work. Um, However, for me to put a person at the office for 12 hours a day, I mean, bare minimum, I'm probably talking two personnel that you'd have to hire, not to mention all the additional paperwork that I see from these proposals. Um, my, my animal's the bear tooth, so everybody knows this, okay? The municipality gave the bear tooth a permit to run their operation with a fraction of the parking that they need for the customer base that they bring into their business. They infringe on every other business around them. Um, 
the gentleman who owns the property across the street, which is what everybody's crying about. There's no less than 30 signs on that property. He does not want Beartooth customers parked on his property. He doesn't want the pizza boxes, the trash, not to mention there could be 100 cars parked in that parking lot at any given time. First tap, a new movie comes out, whatever the case may be. We don't have very many properties that we actually watch and patrol, but that is one of our properties that you have to see where that customer goes. Um, there's really no other way to police that lot. Um, it's one of the, I probably have two or three, that they have to be watched out of the hundreds and hundreds that I have. Thank you. So, Ms. Mosier had a question or a comment, Ms. Mosier. I just, through the chair, I just have a quick, quick question, excuse me. How many curb releases do you think your company does like a month? I can tell you looking at a computer, uh, I, I wouldn't want to guess that just okay. off the top of my head. Okay, maybe I'll connect with you over email if that works. That's fine. Okay, Thank thanks. You. And Mr. Traney has a question. Come. You said you do the bear tooth. Do you tow the cars to your impound lot or do you take them somewhere else to stage them? No, sir. They go straight to my impound lot. So you don't ever stage I have them. never staged cars ever. Okay, good. Thank they you. They always go to our lot. Now, there are some towers that were staging cars who they've got a, an impound lot on Fifth Avenue. They're across town and they were staging them down the street. I've seen them do it. I didn't know what was happening. Okay, appreciate it because we'd heard that. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we require an instant report because you, you if know, they're staging them and they don't get an instant report, then the police... You have all the tours in town and you probably got four, four or five bad apples that are causing problems for everybody. Okay. Now, there are other properties in this town and I mean, these a lot of these are because of municipal permits that have been issued to businesses and to builders. You, you build townhouses for the road going through the middle of all these townhouses that's barely wide enough for one vehicle. There is no street parking on these, these properties. There's a lot of these properties in town. Um, if you park on both sides of the road, there's no way a fire truck's going through there. So you have these houses that have two parking places and people have people over, you know, they come over for dinner, come over for this. These people are parking in places there that are posted that you can't. You know, I mean, we're living this nightmare that everybody else has created, so. I know the builder that created it, the nightmare. Mm -hmm. And when our, he was here, when he was getting his permit, uh, the question was asked, well, what would you do with the fire truck? He said, just run over the fence. And that wasn't the answer to the question. Right. But thank you. Thank you. I, I thank, thank you for your time. Mr. Briggs, I appreciate it. Mr. Jones? Yes, Ms. Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have one other question. It kind of relates to the previous speaker. The previous speaker commented about the issue of a verbal warning if you're monitoring a lot, and I think you explained that you may have to monitor the lot to see where the person is going. So I am taking advantage and asking you a question I thought of for him. Um, and he also mentioned that taking a photo of the violation was a problem. So my question is, if you had to have a choice of a verbal warning or a photo of the violation, which would you choose? I mean, I would take the photo, you know, but now I'm, I'm taking the photo. It's got to be uploaded to a computer, and then the computer, someone has to manipulate that data to put it into the tow call along with they also want my contract with that property owner, so I have to have a copy of that also put into that tow call. I mean, you're, you're talking, I mean, yes, it's all plausible stuff to do. However, you are, you have to pay people ultimately to do this. You know, the more regulation you have, the, the more cost. And um, there was another point I wanted to make and I'm lost train of thought there. Well, if you think of it, we can, we can gotcha, and come back to it. I appreciate it. Um, I, I just, want you to know, and of course the industry as well, I've, I've heard it once said um, that generally some businesses prefer to, to do the consensual tows where parties agree to each other because whatever goes behind their vehicle is they wanted it there. Um, what happens in the, on the PPIs and in large part some of the rotational tows is the owner either doesn't know the car's going away at the hands of another or a third party enters and says, I don't want that car there. You, company, come pick it up. Right. I know you're the guy in the middle, so to speak, but 
realistically the punitive side of it for the public, particularly the area of a parking violation, is generally tens of dollars. I'm talking 25 to 50 dollars, and not in the hundreds of dollars that we see from a tow bill. So we, you know we have to look at it in contrast as well. Okay. I think the most expensive parking violation is handicap, and I think that's somewhere between three and five hundred dollars, depending okay. on where you're at. So, from a painting body standpoint, when's the last time you had a scratch fixed on your car? Well, I, I get that. Okay, a scratch. Sure. Twelve hundred dollars for a scratch. Sure. So every scratch that's on a vehicle, you're, I mean, you're basically, you're at risk. Of course, you caused every scratch on that vehicle, you know, if you towed it from a PPI. Whereas you wouldn't get that from a consent tow. They're not going to be as critical and sure. going over it with a microscope. But that, that's the risk on both sides. The Absolutely. Okay. Well, then, you, so you're asking us to do a tow for our normal rate instead of a PPI rate. Okay. Okay. I, as far as someone watching a property, it's kind of hypocritical that the municipality sets up speed traps around town who are doing exactly what we're doing, and you're, you're okay with them setting up speed traps. Exactly. We don't give tickets for speed traps. It's true. No electronic ones, per se. I mean, how much money do they make on the Glen Highway and 5th and 6th Avenues? I, I, I see them hundreds every morning. We made a lot more money. We had motorcycle cops, but that's another story. I realize that, but I'm just saying you're you're not every wanting us to watch a property, but yet the cops are doing the exact day. same thing. They're hiding in the bushes or behind a, a sign or this that. Now they're setting you, speed. Have you ever seen tow truck operators give bounties to people that call in a, a, a violation? No, sir. I do not. We do not. You don't pay know that going no. on in town. Like I said, we only patrol maybe four properties, five properties. The rest of ours are called in if there's a problem. Uh, we have contracts on, on file. I keep a huge book. So you've got a contract for every lot you tow from? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. And right. what we Thank do, you, we have people who are authorized to call them in, and we give them a code so that we know who we're talking to on the phone to make sure that they are the authorized people to call them in. Thanks so for getting me here. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Anything else? Anyone else? Oh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, on these properties that you're monitoring, have, have instead of hiring someone to watch the property, have you tried, thought about maybe installing cameras? Some of, some of the cameras are pretty inexpensive well, you're pro nowadays. Well, if you look in your wording, it says you're not allowed to use electronic or... Okay. All right. I, w I, was, just, I was just wondering. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to... To, to make this less expensive for everyone. So I just happen to have that question come to mind. Thank you. I think some private business owners actually have, uh, that's why they contact. Some of them have different contracts with con uh, towers. But in the wording of your new proposal, if they use an electronic a camera, a this or that, to watch people and they call the impound in using that camera, they're technically breaking your new ordinances laws. It's, it's posted for a warning, Ms. Jones. Correct. It just has to be posted. Mr. Honeman is correct. It just has to have an audible warning. So if the if there's a camera there, it was anticipated that it would make some type of a sound. You guys are also not getting the point that these people are breaking the law. They, I mean, in your ordinance, look in there. It, you caused. They're they're breaking the law. So why are you you know why are you not charging them a fee on top of our fee? You know, they should have a, a fine. If you're going to charge me three, five hundred dollar fines. The, the, the uh, in summary, I, and I'm not, I'm not speaking to anyone, but in prior the language that's existing in in the ordinance currently, it says that the tow operators post their fees and their fines. Yes, sir, and I do. And my or not? I understand that. Mm -hmm. I understand it. And then it says, and one of the things that we um, have had challenged with was that the fees must be reasonable, and so um, that is a very subjective opinion and the ranges and the rates vary. And so I would challenge you that you're charging a normal fee of over $225 when I know myself that I've had several toes, consensual toes, that are far, far less than that. Uh, now, mind you that we're talking on business day, a normal business day. And to, after hours, they have a different rate. I understand that. On a weekend, sometimes they have a different rate. Um, and I do know that most of the tow companies that I've contracted with are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So regardless of whether they have an office or not. So the challenge is we're talking about taking someone else's property, not with their permission and not with their knowledge in some cases, 
and how do we regulate, and that's the only area that we can, is to look at how do we regulate a fairness of taking. Now, one might say that parking illegally or improperly in someone's spots, a thousand dollar fine, and that's reasonable. Some might say it's a hundred dollars. And that's where we're trying to get. We're trying to find some place that we can protect the public for the pers persistent, what their concerns are, rates that are all over the board, and trying to find something that's fair for both the operator and that rely reminds persons, yeah, if you violate the law, so to speak, if you violate a property owner's right, that there's, it's going to cost you. That's the issue we're trying to figure out. What's it going to cost you? And can it be a little more consistent rather than right. all over the board with what we've had? And, sir, I'm, I'm perfectly good with that. The rates okay. you set are right about my rates. So, okay. like I said, you're trying to punish all of us for three or four or five companies yeah. it, that have caused it's just, the problem. It's, it's just a consistency, and I get it. In business, they want, we don't want monopolies or collusions and things like that. It's just we need to make sure that we're mm -hmm. what you charge. If you get a case of clean crab, crab legs for hauling somebody's car across town, or if you get a million dollars, it's not my business. But if you take someone else's car mm -hmm. and they don't know about it, and they didn't give you permission, we have to have some sort of regulation, which is there, and we're trying to key in on what is reasonable and that is consistent across Absolutely. the community so that everybody knows what we're dealing with. Let's train it. Ombudsman's office. I think Mr. Training was asked, what was it? Just But do you have any of the information available to you right now? That's that was the question I had earlier. Yeah, we and we do have we do receive many complaints from the community. Like I say, a couple of months is a really a no, low number for me uh, on average. I get calls in the middle. So of do you do you know if you've had a complaint of me charging five or six hundred dollars? I I can't specifically because I, I don't, don't I don't generally ask the company. It doesn't to me what what matters is what the ordinance says and what I directed the ordinance to. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Jones. Sorry, since we have the tow operators here and we're just getting some really good feedback from them, um, it would be really helpful if we could hear from the tow operators. Um, the ombudsman can testify at your public hearing on the 5th and spoke to you at your work session. Good point. And I'm just worried that we're going to run out of time. I agree. I agree. Excuse me. Sorry, Mr. Ombudsman. Thank you. Hey, so we, yes, thank you, Ms. Rick. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> My name's Eric, uh, Eric Brown. I work with Action Towing. And um, one of my concerns is um, on the, the pricing, um, you know, what tells you you can tell an industry what to cap there? You can't go into cars and tell them, you know, I only want to pay. 50 cents for this gallon of milk. That's all I'm going to give you. But it, it clearly says, you know, three ninety nine. dollars um, Who's to say, you know, uh, in the middle? You know, um, you know, you can't, I can't tell you how much, you know, you, you're going to charge for a used snow machine, you know. Um, and are you guys going to put caps on the DWI impounds? Because um, those those fees are outrageous. Uh, they can be upwards to fifteen hundred dollars or more. And you guys have regulations on our signs. Our signs have to be all three feet. Well, as where your guys' signs, there are different sizes, different heights, and, and it's kind of unfair to the operators you know you, you guys are setting stipulations for us but you're not following the same stipulations um, um, like on consent private property um, say I was to pull up to your house and park it on on your doorstep and leave my car there for two days and not tell you uh, what's the homeowner to do does he have to go purchase signs from us to have us come and remove the vehicle? He shouldn't have to do that. It's his parking spot. He pays for it. It's his property. He should be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, I have a car that does not belong to me. I don't know where it came from. I want it removed from my property. 
and that's when we come in and we do all the necessary stuff. We call it in, make sure the vehicle isn't stolen. There are steps that we have to go through before we can take the vehicle and steps that we have to take to ensure that we're not doing it incorrectly. Um, this was a couple other things I had. Um, Well, I guess that's about it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And uh, if you have suggestions on what we can do, please feel free to communicate that with us. We'd like to see it in writing so that everybody gets the benefit of, of having what your intentions are behind it. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the towing ordinance? And I think, Koji, are you here currently? Okay. We're going to get to you. We're going to allow a few more moments towards the end for you can discuss it. Thank you for being here, and I know, know we've had to reschedule you. Hello, my name is Anthony Newsom. I'm a driver for Riggs Towing. Um, in 1983, it was deemed $150 was a fair price. So real estate, natural gas, diesel have all gone up in price tenfold. Um, I think at night, our rates are 320 bucks. That's the impound, that's the after hours release. Um, it's only doubled since that time. I think that's a pretty fair amount. And I think they're requiring us to sit on the property that we impound from is very dangerous. Not a good idea. Um, another thing is that, you know, while we're waiting 20 minutes for APD records to give us a number, all sorts of things could happen. Um, also, you know, at the end of that 20 minutes, the owner of the vehicle comes up, and then I got to give him 30 minutes. Um, as far as 100 complaints in a year, I myself do between four and 500 impounds a year. So that's one driver with one company. I also myself have had numerous people tell me that I'm friends with Paul Honeman or I'm friends with Dick Trainey and I'm going to go talk to them. Well, I encourage them to go talk to you guys because they were breaking the law. Um, there's just so many things to touch on. Most of them have already been touched on. Uh, just. I know multiple businesses here have overhead of anywhere between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a month. So if you're charging eighty-five to a hundred dollars for a regular tow, how many tows is that? Um, I think I don't know what the legalities of it, but I think if um, both parties were more in tune to sit down and go over this instead of closed door sessions that have been that have been practiced in the past. Um, the last set of laws that passed, I don't think a single t uh, company owner knew about the new laws until a month and a half after they had passed, or not even passed, a month and a half after they went into law. Um, but. If we have a, a, another meeting here in a couple of days, I, I'm definitely going to make it to that one. And like I said, we've spent a lot of time on this. If anybody else would like to speak, I'd like to give them time. There's a lot to speak about. You bet. And thank you. You did very well. Almost three minutes there. So, Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to say I'm really glad nobody told you that they were friends with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, so is there anyone else who wish to speak um, at this Public Safety Committee meeting on 9.54 or 10.54 on the uh, ordinances changed to the TOEI? Okay. 
Um, it appears then, uh, for the moment, for this meeting anyway, we'll, uh, we'll close testimony on that. Mr. Koji, we'll have you in just a few moments on your issue, but Ms. Gray Jackson. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who was here this afternoon. I really, as my colleagues can agree, I'm sure, appreciate what you had to say. And the old saying is really, really true that there are two sides to every story. And um, frankly, I've heard um, the other side of the story. Folks get in their cars towed and, and there are um, some pretty legitimate concerns. But I'm really pleased that I had the opportunity today and also at a work session to some extent to, to hear the other side of the story from the towing to operators who um, you brought up some, some pretty legitimate concerns, and I'm truly hopeful that um, listening to what you have to say and what the rest of the community has to say, that um, this committee can have some really good recommendations and can bring forward a, a substitute ordinance that will benef be of benefit to the community as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, I, I do want to give uh, Mr. Hess, uh, well, he looks like he might have left. We'll have to get his information at a later point then. I'm sorry. He's, it, is that what you're? We have, um, uh, and Mr. Traney has more knowledge intimately than I do about this. But the last time the towing ordinance was changed, if I'm not mistaken, was implemented 1983. in 1983, and they struggled even then with the amount what was known as reasonable. So since 1983, we've had a couple of attempts to make changes to the law, but quite frankly, there has not been. So um, to the speakers from earlier, this is a, a ordinance that uh, through community concerns and comments is ripe for review. Now there may or may not be uh, significant changes in, when it comes to uh, dollar amounts because we do know that the economy has changed. And there are a lot of things that have changed even since we first started with the DMV I'm not really aware of. But uh, Ms. Tucker, was there, was there something else that I'm missing here? I, I know that Ms. Mosier had uh, some comments that we were going to make but I think not today. And Ms. Tucker, was there anything I'm missing here? Reminder. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, that Daryl um, Thompson, if I have that right, uh, represents uh, uh, several um, operators. Uh, operators, and I know that in the interest of time, uh, his time was cut short. But I wondered if he had just a, any more highlights that he wanted to touch on, or if he's just going to follow through with the written comments. Mr. Thompson, uh, we've only got a few more minutes left. But do you want to follow up with maybe a few more highlights, or did you did you have uh, uh, intention to follow up with in writing? If you could just give you a couple minutes. I'm principally a trial lawyer, so you're inviting me to speak. It's, uh, <laughs> I love to talk. Um, I am going to put this in writing, uh, and I do think that's going to be most beneficial. I have um, a couple other things I wanted to touch, perhaps. Um, um, I, I, I want to echo what was said earlier about the storage uh, storage fees, how it goes $35 a day, and then times 14 equals a 245. And then when you get to the 30-day 30, 30 mark, it's 500. And it really is free storage. And what, what you have to understand is that when people abandon their vehicle under the DMV laws, they can, under Title 28, therefore send, and one of my companies sends $400 a month in, in registered letters alone out to these people, that they are entitled to do... Um, conclude storage and uh, towing charges, right? But um, you're limiting that, of course, by the amount of money that you're cutting it off. They're getting free storage, basically, for all that period of time. And uh, we don't think that's an appropriate thing. You fix it per diem, make it flat, make it the same. Don't give them a break by allowing them to just leave it there for a longer period of time. Doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right. Because the time that it's sitting there is time that someone else who is, could be in that spot. This is a business, and they're not getting $35 a day for that spot. They're having to give someone, basically, free storage for that spot. So we, we think that's uh, not an appropriate way to do that. Um, I, I do know that uh, there are different, I think this was touched earlier, that there are different insurance requirements than, um, and I, I think we'd just ask you to take a look, and I'll put that in writing for you when you have the $225,000 aggregate uh, per year on a hookup, and yet under the municipal it's 50000 per incident. Under the rotational contract, we think that ought to be the same and not different. Um, Mr. And, Traney has a question. It's a question for an insurance. We have to look at that because we may have have to increase the rotational tow to match this because we asked our risk people to give us the current requirements using state law and that's what they came up with. So we'll have to take a look at the rotational to see which off. one's out of balance. 
and have a copy of the storage or the uh, rotational contract that was most recent revised. And it does have on that particular uh, hookup coverage 50,000 minimum per vehicle. Um, and that's you know it's an incident, and not a per aggregate, which is it's different than what you have. I just want to maybe take a look at. We'll take a. And I'm not sure which is going to mesh, but at some point. We'll take a look. It's, yeah, they should be the same. Yeah. Good points. Mr. Thompson, I appreciate that you've taken the time to um, come out again today with, with very little knowledge, not having the benefit of the work session. So we, we uh, look forward to hearing from you and um, for you folks you represent, particularly in writing, because I think that we could get some great value from having that. Those points. Yeah, we'll do it. And we have some stuff highlighted. And I'll, I'll take the time to do that. And just so you know, out. folks, uh, that just because we're having the hearing on November 5th, plenty of time for public testimony if you're willing to, to come to, if you thought of something between now and then. And secondly, uh, that does not mean we'll adopt the regulation or the, or the ordinance changes on that particular night. It, it most likely and likely it could be. It doesn't mean that we won't. It doesn't mean we won't, but it, just, it does, does mean it that it could mean be. we will either. Subject to, uh, to change, Mr. Jones. Just wanted you to know. Okay. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, okay. So we're going to go back. Uh, we did have uh, Koji Gailey. If you could come forward. Uh, just switching gears, uh, there was a concern for public safety. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gailey had been scheduled and actually rescheduled, so we've had postponed this meeting uh, twice now. So, Mr. Gailey, if you'd like to, you've got a few minutes to summarize what you have. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I've worked for a glass company for about seven years, and mostly for myself, and I had a, a business license under an LLC, and I replaced and repaired automobile glass primarily, mostly commercial accounts here at Anchorage, and I tracked over 800 commercial vehicles for the business community, um, and we, um, we noticed a savings from the ac actions of repairing glass on the bottom line for the businesses. And uh, this was done independent of any law enforcement action. There's a, a law in the books from 1978. It's uh, Anchorage Ordinance 9.44.360. And I'd like to reference that ordinance because it's... Um, it's the little things that matter, you know. Gold's down, silver's down. Everybody's excited about the election. Huge upset in San Francisco last night. But the little things that matter are the, uh, to, my, to my company, are the glass options that I have. Can I make money in Anchorage? And can people have glass that's safe, not defective, and legal? And I've noticed in some areas of town, especially noticeable on the east side, there are some driving circles. I just walk the streets and ride my bicycle and I watch the cars go by and sometimes you'll get a whole run of them that are just perfect. And then you'll have a whole run of them that have damage. And I don't know what causes that, but I do know that safe driving is important for everyone. And so I propose that maybe a second resolution might be taken to look at a to task about the existing ordinance for enforcement with 300,000 registered vehicles in the municipality over that, if 50% of them are fine and 25% roughly are covered under existing insurance plans, there's roughly 25% of them that maybe might be fair game for, uh, for uh, any kind of safety inspection, private or public. And that's what I propose to, uh, to do. I, I want to make sure that I word it because it's a sensitive issue following tinting and, and uh, towing and other legal issues that are of a priority to the administration. So that's all I have to say. Okay. So if I'm, uh, to summary, I just want to, uh, you're, you're actually requesting it, perhaps the uh, assembly or the chief of police, someone from the enforcement side, uh, either increased enforcement of the existing code and or perhaps calling for a safety inspection for vehicles? Yes, sir. If I may be so bold as to suggest um, we might lower the, the penalty for the, uh, for the ordinance violation because currently it falls under a general penalty, 30 days in prison and or uh, $2,000, which is quite, quite expensive for a windshield damage. I'd have to go back and look, but I believe in her vehicle, most of those are correctable. So I may be wrong, but most of those are correctable. The infractions are not 
criminal penalties, so what you're, what you're stating is... It, it represents a huge uh, income potential for the muni, because if we have 25% of vehicles that are eligible for such a uh, correctable offense, it would generate a significant amount of uh, economy. But you're not suggesting that it become a criminal penalty, it's just more of a enforcement of what is on the law or, and or the vehicle inspection? It's my understanding it is a criminal penalty, but I, I would suggest for leniency on... I'll double check, but I'm pretty convinced it's not. I believe it's a correctable. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be, uh, depending on the severity of the crack, it could be that there's a, a fine. I'll have to double check to make sure. It's been a few years since I wrote a defective windshield ticket, but it's been, uh, it's been my experience that it's a correctable or at, at, at most it's a, an infraction, which means no jail time, fine only. I think it was th section 390 and 400 okay. of the same... Uh, chapter and title. But thank you, Mr. Gailey. We'll definitely uh, look at that, and I'll pass the information about enforcement over to the Chief of Police. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Gray-Jackson. Ms. Gray-Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Cody. I know we've been trying to get you here for like a couple of months, and I'm glad you were able to make it. But you also talked to me through email about the possibility of some draft ordinance that you had. Um, prepared, and if that is the case, I would really like for you to, to send it to us so we can take a look at it and possibly discuss it at a, a future public safety committee meeting. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Is there anything else that we haven't covered on the agenda, Ms. Uh, Tucker? Is there anything that you like covered with for this body for this, going forward on this particular matter? Uh, no, not. I just. Uh, as the assembly does, uh, really appreciate everybody who came. We, uh, Barbara and I, have both been uh, scribbling notes, and uh, as for me, and I, and I believe for her too, and I'll let her speak for herself. We're really excited about the input that we got here, and um, uh, are very encouraged. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I would like to thank you, Mr. Honeman, and the rest of the members of the Public Safety Committee for inviting us here and asking us to talk about this, the work that we've done for you, and also allowing us to listen to the public. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Steele, I know you're not a member, but uh, would you have any comments, suggestions moving forward? Mr. Traney, anything? Ms. Gray Jackson? Ms. Peters? Okay. I, I do want to thank um, staff. I want to thank uh, the Ombudsman's office and uh, my colleagues here, of course, not, not only on the body, but uh, those that have taken the time of their schedule to come to be uh, learn more about uh, the ordinance change and from what the perspective of the community and the industry is. So I want to thank each and every one of you. And I know that it has been a long haul. And to get to where we're at today, it appears that we may have a bit more tweaking and adjusting to do, and I look forward to doing that in a, in a uh, very thoughtful manner. So at that, uh, this meeting is now closed or adjourned. 1.58 p.m.